Epigenetics. The idea that what our parents and grandparents have done before we were even born affects us today. The idea that genes aren't locked away and unchanged no matter what in an individual, but can be affected and altered in the, for the child. In the past, people believe that genes are destiny and that the experiences and life choices of the grandparents and the parents have no effect on the child. But if the grandparents or parents smoked or were subjected to extreme stress or any other factor, the child would not be affected by this at all because the child did not, because the child did not experience these things. And for a long time, this was what people believed, that our genes are locked away and are unimpacted by our choices. Until around the time of the Human Genome Project completed in 2003, which was said to be the answer to the world's problems, to disease and disorders. Because at this time, scientists still believe that one gene means one disease, and that after the Human Genome Project, we would be able to find out find which gene was for which disease and cure it. But this theory was proven wrong. They found that only about 20,000 genes encoded for about 100,000 different proteins. Only about 1% of our DNA contains genes that code for proteins. Rice plants have more coding genes than we do, but we are far more complex than proteins. But far more complex, aren't we? Then scientists started to wonder, what does the rest of the DNA not used for coding proteins do? Are they just junk? But how are we so complex? Then scientists realized that all this extra DNA may not actually be just junk, but, a way, but may be the reason why we are so complex. This brought forth the concept of epigenetics with the idea that a gene can be read in multiple ways and be either switched on or off. But these different ways of reading a gene are triggered by environmental factors, experience from our parents, passing acquired traits and characteristics to the next generation and generations to come. Where genes are switched off or on by different factors in the parent, in the parent changing the protein that the genes produce. This concept, concept started to change how pe some people thought of genes, but at this time, the theory lacked sufficient evidence. The concept of acquired characteristics and traits isn't a new theory. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, a French biologist in the 19th century, proposed his theory of acquired characteristics, where or organisms pass on acquired traits from their ancestors traits that were altered directly by the environment, to adapt to the environment because he believed nature strove for perfection. One example he used was the acquired characteristics of the long legs and neck of giraffes, that since the giraffe needed to stretch their necks to get food, it acquired a longer neck, and later in life passed it on to its offspring. Though at this time, his theory was against Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection where it was survival of the fittest that controlled the genes of the next generation and that random mutations push natural selection. This theory of natural selection is much more accepted than Lamarck's theory of acquired characteristics. Though Darwin did link variations in the species to the variations of the environment, stating, in my opinion, the greatest error that I have committed has not been allowing sufficient weight to the direct action of the environment. For example, food and climate, independently of natural selection. When I wrote The Origin, for some years afterwards, I could find little good evidence of, to, of the direct action of the environment. Now there is a large body of evidence. Darwin did believe, in a way, the environment could affect the organism and pass on acquired characteristics through, part, though this part of his work was ignored during the 20th century. The view that the environment does not alter the genes of the offspring was primarily influenced by the, an experiment carried out by August Weissman, where he cut off the tails of male and female mice and bred them to see if the characteristics was inherited by the offspring over multiple generations, and found that the loss of tail did not pass on to the next generation, disproving Lamarck's theory. Though there was a problem with Weissman's experiment, the mice still needed their tails. So the loss of the tail of the mice 
was not adaptive. Lamarck states that the acquired characteristic must be adaptive and be beneficial to the animal. Though his theory was still neglected, neglected, neglected and ignored during the 20th century. Now fast forward to 2003, when an experiment is being conducted by Randy Jertle and Rob Waterland on epigenetics. We experimented with a strain of a Guti gene in mice, where this gene gives the mice an extra piece of DNA, which makes them obese, have yellow fur, and are prone to diabetes and cancer. The mice that lack this gene are brown and do not suffer these effects. In our experiment, the diet was changed to methyl-rich foods, such as onions, garlic, and beans, for the Aguti mother before, during, and after pregnancy. Changing its environment, this led to thinner brown furred offspring. Yet the controlled group where the Aguti mother was not fed these foods gave birth to fat yellow furred offspring. In the brown furred offspring, the Aguti gene was still present and no letters in the DNA were changed, but the gene was switched off in the offspring. And when these offspring had their own offspring, the gene was still present, but it was also still switched off, giving evidence to epigenetics that a cha change in environment for the mother or the grandmother or even the ancestor can have a dramatic effect on the offspring and later generations. Another aspect of epigenetics is the theory of genetic imprinting, where a gene is imprinted with it if it came from the mother or if it came from the father. This theory was found when a scientist noticed a particular peculiar phenomenon when diagnosing children with two different types of genetic disorders. One was angel men syndrome, where the child, de child had, has delayed development, unable to learn how to speak, severe retardation, seizures. They were hyperactive and had a, and have constant inappropriate laughter. The other being prada willi syndrome, where the child has respiratory problems, muscle weakness, obesity, mild mental disability, and obsessive compulsive mannerisms. Two very different sy syndromes and symptoms, but they have something very special in common. They are both due to the, the deletion of the same base pairs of chromosome 15. But what makes them different? The difference is whether the deletion can comes from the mother's or the father's genes. Scientists found that if the deletion of the base pairs were from the mother's side, and the father's chromosome 15 was switched off, the child developed Engelmann syndrome. But if the base pair deletion was from the father's genes, and the mother's chromosome was switched off, the child developed prada willi syndrome. Scientists then realized that the genes seem to have some sort of memory, remembering which parent they came from. This was then dubbed genetic imprinting. These two definitely were born identical. Though one was born in predatory waters, where the other was born in water with no predators. The Daphnia that was born in predatory waters developed, and developed a helmet and ne neck teeth to protect themselves from predators with a spiny tail. While the Daphnia in waters with no predators did not develop a helmet or back teeth, nor did it develop a spiny tail. And these two, definitely, are twins and identical. I believe that life experiences of our generation and ancestors can affect our lives and health today. And I believe that we have an obligation and responsibility to look after our genes, because they are our legacy and the future of the human race. What we do in our lifetime affects the future of the, of the generations to come, so why not protect it? Even though if the father strengthens his muscles, the child will not gain this adaptation, showing some factors can't be epigenetically inherited. But other factors such as stress and hunger can affect the child and, and the next generations to come. In the end, we should take care of our genes, because what we do in our life may affect future generations. Our genes aren't locked away. Maybe I'm blind. <laughs> so maybe I can see through this and see what's behind. Got no way to prove it, so maybe I'm lying. But I'm a 